Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this session following on from the wonderful performances in the last session. Uh, it's looking like we're going to get some more amazing uh, performances now. Uh, starting with Lolita Emanuel, who's going to do, um, talk about performing Assyrianness. Um, Lolita is an Assyrian and Armenian musician born on Gabrigal land and navigating many worlds. She's a pianist, vocalist, academic tutor and researcher. Um, she's currently undertaking a DMA um, with her research focus, as she said before, on developing new approaches to Assyrian art music. Um, I met Lolita a couple of months ago at Paradisec and I was really struck by her passion um, to talk about her Assyrian background and a nation of people and a religious, I guess, a religious nation of people. A nation. I would say a, a community, ethnic, ethno-religious An ethno, yeah, yeah that, that doesn't have a nation state. And so it's so important, the work that she's doing, but I'll pass it over to you because you'll um, hear all about it. Thank you. Thanks, Jody, and it's uh, yeah, great to see everyone here. Shlam um, alochon, that is hello in Assyrian, or peace be upon you. Um, I want to start by recognizing that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Gadigal and the Darug peoples. I acknowledge and pay my respects to all Gadigal, Gadigal and uh, Darug ancestors and elders and any First Nations people here today. The Gadigal and Darug people are the traditional custodians of this land, and I want to acknowledge that they've cared for country for thousands of years. This always was and always will be Assyrian Aboriginal land, actually. Um, I'll be talking about Assyrian music today, um, but I wanted to start this way to talk about how, um, you know, my, my research actually is inspired by many Indigenous um, musicians and scholars both here in this continent and around the world. So in performing Assyrianness, I ask what it means to perform the small but growing genre of um, the growing art genre uh, within my community, who are the stateless and transnational Assyrians. And while the definition of this genre is still evolving, um, Existing works mainly are in the vocal piano um, genre and are composed with what the ethnomusicologist Rochelle Pakbaz describes as a blend of Assyrian music with Middle Eastern and Western art compositional techniques. Um, and in this genre, there are very little piano works, solo piano works, um, and the repertoire that does exist is dominated by non-Assyrian composers. These works largely utilize the European uh, style of musical nationalism, which has drawn criticisms from our community for privileging regional styles and lacking, quote unquote, Assyrian roots. And it's these compositions that have prompted me as a pianist um, to search for new ways to perform this genre in a new performance framework that shifts away from the musical nationalism model and instead reconsiders performance through a grounding of existing Assyrian resiliency practices. So who are the Assyrians? Um, while my community are indigenous to northern Mesopotamia, or the lands that now span present day Iraq, Iran, Syria and Turkey, our indigeneity is not recognized in those modern nation states. Assyrians trace their continuity back to the ancient Assyrian empire, and we speak an endangered language called Surat, um, which is a dialect of Neo-Aramaic that comes from Assyria. Because of ongoing oppression in our ancestral homelands, most Assyrians live in uh, the diaspora across Southwest Asia and all around the globe. Predominantly a Christian group, Assyrians have experienced repeat genocides, systematic and forced assimilation through Arabization policies, as well as more recent discriminati uh, discriminatory policies of the Kurdish regional government in northern Iraq. A common anxiety within my community is that without a state structure to sustain cultural heritage and protect Assyrian rights, our culture and language uh, won't survive beyond the next two generations. That's a uh, very kind of common anxiety within the community. But um, despite the widespread uh, exclusion and misrepresentation 
of Assyrians across political, social, economic, and scholarly contexts, music, dance, and performance more broadly have provided us with an alternative space for recognition and empowerment. So, like I said before, the existing compositions within um, the uh, Western art music genre um, tend to focus on Orientalist depictions of the ancient Assyrians. Um, and there's only a handful of Assyrian composers who write solo piano music. Um, and this means the genre, the genre of Assyrian art music is left dominated by non-Assyrian composers who transmit their own narratives of Assyrianness, um, often misrepre misrepresenting, erasing, or conflating our culture. This leaves Assyrians like me with the tricky challenge of navigating and undoing these misrepresentations. I've already um, introduced my community to you today, but I wanted to show you a clip from the popular 1979 Peter Brooks film um, called Meetings with Rem Remarkable Men. And it's based on the book of the same name by the Greek Armenian spiritual leader and mystic called George Gurdjieff. And in this, we hear a little bit of a different story about who the Assyrians are. This is Yelov. Hello. He's a nice You know what that means? Uh? Boil seven Russians, you get a Jew. Boil seven Jews, you get an Armenian. Boil seven Armenians, you get an Isor. What, what, what do you know about Isor? <laughs> an Isor can make good business out of anything. <laughs> so this film features arrangements of music written by Gurdjieff um, and their works that are well known even outside of the film and um, definitely uh, largely across Western contexts. Um, and it's in these compositions that non-Assyrian narratives about Assyrians are circulated, um, making their way into public misunderstandings about Assyrians. This is yellow. So I just wanted to show you this podcast episode from um, ABC. Um, and there, in this podcast, um, the hosts are discussing um, the, the 2014 attack of the Assyrians and Yazidi communities in um, Iraq, the attack by ISIS. And I just want you to have a listen to this excerpt. You're listening to The Spirit of Things here on RN and on Radio Australia. And this is music from the northern Iraq region based on an ancient Assyrian Christian mourning ritual. Um, this excerpt was um, an arrangement of one of Gurdjieff's works called Assyrian Women Mourners, which I'll be performing today. Um, and alongside this, Gurdjieff also has another piece called Song of the Isors, which is the Russian name for um, the Assyrians. Um, and these Assyrian works were written to accompany his spiritual dance practice, which he called movements. Um, they were dances and exercises um, choreographed by Gurdjieff, and he claims that the pieces are based on melodies um, of various communities across Asia that he accessed esoterically uh, during his extensive travels there. Um, and he also says that he remembers, you know, he, has a, he says that he has a very good memory and was able to remember all of these melodies um, despite the fact that he um, began writing the music 30 years after those, um, those, those musics were heard. Um, but Joanna Petch's critical analysis of Gurdjieff's work reveals that his claims of the source's origins are highly unlikely, um, especially, like I said before, since the, the music was composed 30 years after those travels, and that there are no records of music transcriptions from those events. Um, he wrote this music in collaboration with a Russian pianist called Thomas de Hartmann in 1925. And basically, Gurdjieff would stand at the piano um, who, and would sing, hum, or tap these melodies that he'd heard. And Thomas de Hartmann would directly um, play them back onto the piano and add his own harmonies to these pieces. Um, instead, uh, Pech actually uh, highlights that 
these are Orientalist depictions of those musical cultures. And um, they, usually, they utilize techniques that um, largely resemble the 19th and 20th century um, compositional trends of exoticism and nationalism. Have I lost you yet? Well, the years... Hopefully I have not lost you yet, but let's go next. Um, so while we don't know the exact origins of this song, I just wanted to compare Gurdjieff de Hartmann's expression of Assyrian women mourning with an Assyrian mourning tradition as expressed by Teraye, who are an Assyrian tribe from the uh, mountainous regions of Hakkari, which is in present day Turkey. So we heard a little bit of Assyrian women mourners. This is um, an excerpt that's sung at a funeral. So I just want to give people a content warning. It's pretty emotional. Um, here we go. <laughs> So it's really emotional. Um, and some people actually believe that Assyrian women mourners is based on this um, uh, Assyrian mourning practice, which uh, my community might know as the Jinanyata tradition, where certain women are chosen to attend a funeral and sing improvised and rhymed lamentations about the deceased to help the family grieve. Without going into a full-on ethnomusicological analysis of these songs, I think that a lot can be observed about the differences in um, lamenting from a timbral, expressive, or emotive point of view. Um, but I think this is, it's definitely worth doing a, an ethnomusicological analysis of this soon. Um, so this piece, Assyrian Women Mourners, and its choreographed dance from those movements have actually become quite popular around the world. And by giving it an Assyrian title, Assyrian Women Mourners, it paints a picture to its listeners about Assyrians and our culture. Gurdjieff says that Isors, or Assyrians, can make good business out of anything. Well, Gurdjieff, uh, a brief look at what I call an Assyrian resiliency practice makes me think that actually Assyrians can perform Assyrianness out of anything. The Assyrian use of music in acts of resistance, remembrance, and defiance have been understood by scholars as a response to repeat silencing, erasure, and extreme persecution. A really good example of this are the privately sung and repressed mourning songs uh, by the survivors of the 1915 Assyrian genocide, um, which occurred in the Ottoman Empire. And to this date, the Turkish government um, still deny that these events uh, occurred. These songs were transformed in diaspora into powerful protest songs on stage. And they actually included eyewitness accounts of those genocide events. So this can be understood as an Assyrian resiliency practice. And I wanted to kind of flesh that out through the ethnomusicological concept of motility. Um, and uh, Martin Stokes, the ethnomusicologist, uh, draws on this concept from sociology. And he says that motility is the way in which an individual appropriates what is possible in the context of uh, mobility or migration and puts this potential to use for individual or group uh, goals or activities. While concerns about cultural survival remain, the concept of motility helps us understand how Assyrians reassemble or repurpose the available tools in transnational diaspora to remain resilient and to sustain our cultural practices. What I like about motility is that it's an approach that can highlight human agency and embrace the diverse and uh, the diverse sonic expressions of Assyrianness that um, have been formed and are shaped by many waves of displacement. So today's performance will be my restaging of Assyrian Women Mourners, drawing inspiration from the Stolo Scholar and the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Arts, Dylan Robinson's decolonial restaging methodology. 
He presents this methodology as a reparative model for Western art music works that appropriate and erase Indigenous musics with um, very little engagement with those Indigenous uh, communities from which they appropriate. And my performance features visual art by the US-based Assyrian artist, Diki Bato, who I commissioned to help me bring this resiliency practice to these art music compositions. Together, we both repurpose artistic tools available in the transnational diaspora to recenter Assyrian narratives of resilience. So I'll be performing Assyrian Women Mourners now. And if I could figure out how to dim the lights, that would be amazing. Um, maybe I should hit this button, but it doesn't seem to be working. There we go. And to turn off this Projection.
Thank you. So I just think we are waiting on something. Yeah. Okay, all good? Cool. So I frame Dickey's artistic practice as constituting part of um, the Assyrian resiliency practice that I've mentioned today. Dickey reassembles pieces of Assyrianness in the context of displacement, genocide, and erasure by layering Assyrian faces over ancient Assyrian symbols, statues, and artifacts. The art installation that you saw in my performance itself is actually a reassembly of an earlier work by Bato that I saw online and was moved by. Um, he calls it a note on the ruins for the visitors, and it uses ISIS propaganda footage from 2015 that shows ISIS destroying ancient Assyrian artifacts in Mosul, Iraq. And this was just months after ISIS began attacking local communities in Iraq and Syria. A large portion of them were already displaced Assyrians um, who were given three options by ISIS. Pay a tax, convert to Islam, or be killed. The footage, um, as, and this is the original, um, actually, the original work, A Note on the Ruins um, for the Visitors, which was an exhibition art installation. Um, the footage is really hard to watch. It actually provokes a physical response from me when I see it. It's, it's very upsetting. Um, and it was traumatizing for many. This destruction had a significant impact on the local and indigenous communities of Iraq, like Assyrians and Yazidis, whose cultural mem memories are comprised of these ancient symbols. Helen Malko, the anthropological archeologist, stresses that this was a deliberate act of cultural genocide that occurred hand in hand with the killing, enslaving, and torture of minority groups, and was deliberately aimed at erasing their cultural memory and identity. When I spoke to Dickey about this work, he told me that seeing the ISIS footage prompted him to reflect on his relationship with his Assyrian identity. Dickey's family fled Diyarbakir, which is in present-day Turkey, during the 1915 genocide. They fled to Syria um, in Aleppo, stayed there for 10 years, and then eventually moved to the United States. He said that he didn't grow up around many Assyrians in the US. And for most of his life, he relied on seeing ancient artworks and artifacts that he regularly saw at the Met. This is um, Dicky with one of his works that are drawn from um, a note on the ruins for the uh, visitors. And that's me at a museum, I think London Museum over there, looking at our ancient symbols and reconnecting with them. So apparently I have one minute to go, but I also have one more performance to go. Uh, so, um, I think I would love to play this for you all. So what I will do is I'll leave you with this. We can brew on this a little bit later. And um, this is going to be at the Palace of Ashurba Nepal, composed by Ilya Demutsky. And I just want to highlight that my restaging of this work is, not, um, is less a critique of the composition because the composition was gifted to the Assyrian community, but rather is a, it's a restaging that celebrates um, the Assyrian resiliency practice.
Thank you for that really nice applause. Cool. Um, so to recap, um, I wanted to talk about this resiliency practice again um, to highlight that despite uh, exclusion across various platforms where Syrians would usually um, uh, search for recognition and seek recognition, Assyrians have been able to use performance as a powerful tool for empowerment. Wherever we've migrated, Assyrians have been able to look at the tools around them, pick them up, use them as materials, you know, whether they're bricks, food, or musical instruments, and create home. Despite ongoing oppression, we demonstrate perseverance by inventing new ways of practicing and sustaining our culture. Um, and this was just one example of how um, we can use decolonial restaging practices um, to kind of approach works like this, which transmit um, exogenous or non-Assyrian narratives of Assyrians, of Assyrianness. Um, thank you, Vasim Araba, which is thank you in Assyrian. And um, I think we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Lolita. That was incredibly moving um, performances. I think we are running short of time, but maybe we have time for one, one or two questions. Um, if anyone, yes, uh, do we have? A, uh, we just bring the microphone over, if you don't mind, just so that people on Zoom can hear the question. Thank you so much for a thought-provoking presentation and for inspiration and playing in this video. It was great. I wanted to ask you something, how you connected Gurdjieff with the Assyrian and how you connected with the national identity? Because as far as I understood of Gurdjieff's work, it was all about awakening human being to the fourth dimension. Yes, yes. Which so is non-identity with anything. So I wanted to know how this fits in in your understanding. Yeah, so to clarify when you say how I made the connection between Gurdjieff and Assyrian, yeah. uh, what do you mean exactly by that? Um, so how uh, I... As far as understood this in his works, he used this basically to wake up human spirit. Yes. To the fourth dimension, as yeah. he calls it. Yeah. And I wanted to know how you weave this into your work. Yes, yeah. So, um, like I said before, as a pianist, I'm dealing with a small repertoire of um, solo works that are about or represent Assyrians. Um, and I talk, and I didn't get a chance to kind of flesh it out properly before, but I talk about this idea of um, phantom genealogies, which is drawn from Nina Sun Eidsheim's um, research on um, the ways that perceptions or ideas of um, an African-American operatic timbre are actually transmitted through performances and public conversations about um, African-American um, vocalists. So that's drawn from there. And the whole idea behind that is looking at the ways that um, ideas or conversations about um, people uh, are transmitted through music and performance and shape um, majority understandings um, about those communities. Um, I, the Song of the Isaurs and Assyrian Women Mourners represent the Assyrians in a particular way. Um, and Gurdjieff and Dehartment, but specifically Gurdjieff, benefited a lot by drawing on this idea of, of Assyrianness or drawing from Assyrian culture. Um, but the idea of that was purely to suit his compositional practice. Um, but there's a consequence of that for communities like the Assyrians. Um, the consequence is that it transmits um, misrepresented uh, or incorrect ideas about the Assyrians that don't align with how our community talks about ourselves. So I talk about how music can actually um, can be harmful in that way um, and then how performance can give us an opportunity to respond to that. And to just cap that off, um, this is in the context of a widespread misunderstanding of Assyrians. Not many people know who the Assyrians are. In um, the scholarly world, both in Western and um, Middle Eastern contexts, Assyrians are um, a race regularly. Um, and these musical works, although they benefit Gurdjieff and his followers, they actually contribute to this erasure and misrepresentation. Thank you. 
I think I took up all the question time with that answer. <laughs> it was a pretty good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, cool. Lanita. That thank was so fascinating. I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion um, yes. in the break time. Yes. Yes, cool. in the drinks, yes, in the drinks uh, yes. down there. I have a few questions to ask for yeah. you down there. Too. Yeah, looking so, forward to it. Thank you. Can we hear? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.